in the initial. Okay. Sure, sure, no problem. So we are live. However, I've got some work to do. We'll be right with you. Podcast will start in about three minutes. We could do that crazy countdown. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. And for those of us just hanging out here in the lobby here, just give us a few moments. We'll be starting the show shortly. How was your week, Daniel? It was a gentle downward slope. I started off pretty strong, and then uh, I want to say <laughs> approaching Friday, I get kind of tired. I got really tired this week. And then... yeah. I hear you, man. I hear yeah. You. yeah. Did you have any late nights staying up working? I mean, that's the one thing that, that stays pretty consistent is my sleep schedule. I would say the latest night I was up like probably 12 p.m., but that was the latest I go. Usually I'm in bed by like 1030 and then I wake up around 645 so I can get my run in. I got a new pair of pokas, so I've been putting on uh, putting on oh, two and good. three. Yeah, dude, dude, they feel amazing. I would recommend hocus to anybody. I'm using the, the clouds right now. Oh yeah, but I've seen Hocus is a pretty competitive running shoe in regards to support and um, just the longevity of them, which is good. Even then, like I feel like you need to switch out your running shoes every six months to a year, but I don't really do that. I, I put them in a different category of shoe, but I don't replace them. Right. You know, after a year, it might not be running long distance with those same shoes but you gotta you gotta keep them in the rotation you know and we'll just make one more post here on the facebook so i can let people know today's topic is habit psychology let's say join us as we dive into the literature <laughs> should i say peer-reviewed literature it's what it is it's a couple of peers doing a review of a peer reviewed yeah a couple of peers going over some peers. peer reviewed yeah exactly a lot of peering here we're all peer i'm peering into the future I'm trying to peer into my mind with these topics yeah uh, I feel like I always think about how simple these topics can be, but also how complex they are the more you really break them down. I feel like it's very um, it's very limited if you look at habit as just a something that is a given and uh, doesn't deserve any more questioning in your own life. But it takes it takes a lot of um, awareness. And uh, like we mentioned, other forms that there are to measure, some habits are 
long term. So you might not even recognize that it's a habit because like so many steps to it, you don't realize that the the outcome of of that behavior had a bunch of multi step habits that led up to it. You know, right? Uh, Daniel, what's up, buddy? I want Daniel on this podcast, by the way. Oh, he's gonna be the, joining the us soon. Daniel. What yeah. do we be? All right. So um, I kind of like what you're getting into there um, with regards to habits being something that, you know, we don't take too much time to think about these things because we kind of take them for granted. And in episodes past, we talk a lot about how habits are um, some of the key defining features of habits are that they are automatic and that they run in our subconscious mind and they sort of operate. Um, under what is known as automaticity. Um, and so that has a lot of uh, reason behind it. Um, it is, as we've discussed, it's calorically, it's very calorically expensive for you to use your frontal cortex essentially to cognitively think about why it is that you're doing what you're doing. Um, it takes a lot of uh, what we've also termed willpower um, and there's psychological literature to back up that whole discussion. Um, which is that we have limited willpower to essentially use our conscious mind to think about different things. Um, in addition to that, um, I, I just think it's really good to start break, to breaking down like exactly what, what goes into exactly what a habit is. So I love that you kind of started us off with talking about like us kind of underestimating um, like what habits are, because by nature, they are just something that we do automatically and which brings up a very interesting thing. And it's how much of our behavior is from our conscious mind um, and how much of our behavior is simply deemed by habits. Yeah, I think from the from the literature we've read, it seems like there are behaviors that we very consciously do, but after some time, they reach this point of automaticity as we've said, it's a very fun word to say. I encourage you to say it <laughs> and find it in your in your uh, in your own day to day habits. Um, there's a lot of behaviors that once took plenty of initiative and willpower, even, but then they've reached this point where they're just happening automatically. And the more I started to realize how many behaviors have multiple steps, the more I really started to question how much my day to day was just yeah, automatic was behavior and how much of it was actually thought out critical, you know, processes that I was undergoing in order to accomplish a task. Even like my whole morning, I used to think that I had a bunch of different behaviors, a bunch of individual habits before I went to work. Now I'm realizing that it's all just one habit that has over time compounded a bunch of behaviors onto itself a bunch of complex behaviors even driving now to work which is something that you know i don't think anyone wants to admit it's automatic you want to say oh no i'm, I'm very consciously driving to work and no I'm man sure that i'm staying in the lines and i'm stopping to do it's all automatic after a certain point right it's, it's really crazy and thinking about how at one point when you were driving a car it took a lot of conscious like thought behind like, okay, this is how hard I should push on the pedal. And this is when I should push on the brake. And this is how much effort I should put into turning the steering wheel. Um, that goes into a lot of like how habits actually become integrated. And a lot of, uh, a lot of it gets integrated into your brainstem. So it becomes like motor speaking automatic, uh, which is really interesting. Um, there's like a whole feedback loop that, that goes into that, but, it's it's like all these different things that once required so much thought into the details of like these different actions that we're doing now you're able to a habit is cool in that since it doesn't require as much conscious like willpower and thought you can do other things and you can actually double task more efficiently and that's one of the characteristics of habits you're successfully able to double task and that, that's one of those things that you can actually, this was demonstrated in a few other studies where they had people who had done something brand new and they tried to double test that thing that was brand new. And 
that did not go so well for them when compared to them trying to double task with a habit and then doing something else on top of that habit. So habits have been demonstrated to essentially be resilient to like cognitive stressors, which is really cool. So if that's the case, it's like we can use these things to our advantage. Right. There's there's a certain limit to the strength our intentions have. And when you start multitasking, you're spreading that intention very thinly across all these tasks. But the habit itself, especially once it's reached that point of automaticity, it does not need the input of a strong intention. It already has the input of the strong habit itself to perform that behavior. So as you said, you might give someone a task to add on to what they're already used to doing. And it's actually something that they're able to focus power onto, give intention to, while the habit that they're performing simultaneously is running on shortcut neurological processes that have been built over time and strengthened without the need of intention anymore. Right. So um, let's go ahead and start breaking down um, a little bit of that chapter five um, that we kind of dove into. So uh, the book we're referencing is called The Habit of Psychology, or I'm sorry, the, what was it called? It's actually a multiple part name. And I want to make sure I have the author in here too. Here, I haven't pulled up. It was like, fact. there's multiple. It's The Psychology of Habit, edited by Vasper Plankin. And it does reference quite a few articles in the book. Psychology of Habit, Theory, Mechanisms, Change, and Context. It's published by Springer. And as we joked about before, it's from the Department of Psychology, University of Bath, Bath, UK. Nice. Very clean folk over there. So that's incredible. And we thank every single one of them, not just the editor, but also all the authors involved in the articles that the editor references when making this compilation. Because Daniel and I have spent weeks, if not almost two months now, reading through this book, breaking it down, appreciating it, and also wanting to spread it with the audience that we have here. So if you'd like to access the book, it is available PDF online. There's a small fee for it. Or if you do have some kind of login through a institution, you might be able to access at least some of the sections of this book through that institution. Would recommend if you couldn't tell. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so Danny, about... Danny just posted oh. a comment. Yeah, go on. Um, she said, you guys are talking very much about fast intuition day-to-day driving versus slow, which is conscious reasoning. Uh, so that seemed, that's like a whole other framework that we could use to kind of understand our habitual behaviors. Um, so fast intuition would be like, oh, I already know how to do this. Like, let me just do it. Like, because you've done it so many times before versus the slow conscious reasoning which is like pulling up to a freeway and you have to make a decision. Do I turn here or do I turn here? Um, and he's saying that that's a big conversation uh, that's made by Dr. Kahneman. So um, we'll have to have you on Danny boy for uh, one of these episodes to kind of go deeper into that. Cause that sounds like a neat uh, psychological framework to kind of uh, dig into. Okay. So Today's chopping block is chapter five in the psychology of habit. And this one kind of breaks down some of the mechanisms and the complexities, the mechanisms of the habit and the uh, complexity of the behaviors. And they use these things to categorize different forms of habits that we have. And what Daniel and I actually talked about earlier on this, uh, before we started the podcast, is that we realized the goal, the actual reward, whether it be pleasure or not, comes a lot into the calculation of how these habits are categorized. More importantly, 
how these goals are achieved, whether they are achieved instantly or over a long period of time, and whether they are achieved in one step or it takes multiple steps to achieve the goal of that habitual behavior. Taking these four categories and combining them to have a one-step instant pleasure versus a one-step long-term pleasure, as well as the two-step, multi-step, short-term versus long-term pleasures, you do find, as referenced in the book, that there's a bit of a quadrant section created. And I've had some fun being able to break down different behaviors in my life. And I'd love to hear what Daniel has to say about different behaviors in his life that fit into these categories. As I found that it allowed me to have a bit more understanding of them by being able to place them in each of these compartments. So we can go ahead and start with the one step instant pleasure, otherwise known as one step hedonic habits. One that I've talked poorly about has been social media. Right. What would be one that you've explained? Um, yeah, I mean, I think social media usage is a big, a huge example of uh, one step hedonic behavior. I think junk food eating as well. Um, it's like a one step sequence, um, basically, where you have this thing in front of you and it all it takes for you to do is one step uh, hand into bag, bag into or uh, food into mouth and then a bag Just into mouth. Bag to mouth, thing. dude. The whole thing, bro. Um, so I think that's a really a really good example of a one step hedonic behavior. Um, and then what else? Um, <laughs> for some reason in my mind, I'm like breathing. <laughs> well, you could definitely see it that way. No, nah, I think it's it's so necessary. Um, I think, I think it's key though, that we define, uh, hedonic, uh, and that kind of, I'm not going to go super deep yet into like the whole, like asceticism no, versus do. hedonic. It's going to be half of what we're talking about today. Okay. Uh, so basically hedonism or hedonic, uh, has to do with pleasure being your highest goal in life. Um, so it's interesting that uh, habit psychology has sort of tied in this philosophy um, into, and I love when philosophy and psychology line up together. Uh, realistically, um, all sciences stem from philosophy um, because Aristotle gave us the Aristotelian method, which historically speaking gave rise to modern science. Um, however, um, I think understanding what hedonism is in this context is really important. So basically, when we say that we align ourselves to hedonism, we're saying that pleasure is is like our ultimate, like our ultimate desire in life. Um, so that that it's kind of like what we're talking about, how it's very short term. It's very uh, it's almost impulsive. Um, so that which makes me feel good is my compass in life and at what like the downside to that is at whatever means necessary i'm going to preserve my own pleasure so you can see how that would lead to conflict in society when your needs or your desires for pleasure uh, come into contact with uh, the desires for pleasure in other people um, it inevitably leads you to uh, conflict so hedonism i would say is probably not the best philosophy to live by. I mean, there are some people who uh, would probably be proponents of hedonism. Um, however, I think if you take a more, I, I personally like asceticism. Um, so asceticism is the opposite of hedonism um, in terms of philosophy. And basically what asceticism is, is saying no to immediate pleasures, uh, kind of like we've talked about before, for longer term gain. Um, and in many cases, uh, this is taught throughout many different religions. A lot of the monotheistic religions talk about this. Um, you deny yourself pleasure for a spiritual attainment, um, which is really cool. Because uh, essentially, 
it's saying no to animalistic desires so that you can ascend to something greater than the immediate experience of pleasure. So that is kind of in a nutshell what asceticism uh, would be. Um, let's see. Which really helps too. Because um, I feel like a lot of simple instant gain pleasures aren't typically the best for you, especially long term. Because they have some consequences. So when you adapt a form of mentality as you have that prioritizes the delay gratification of achieving satisfaction from long-term dedication to something versus giving into instant pleasures. Uh, I think that has uh, plenty of benefit that is not just only the benefit of achieving your goal, but also the benefit of not indulging in the instant pleasures. Do you want to take a moment and address some of the comments here? Yeah. Uh, let's see. We've got one here. What perhaps interesting to contemplate is where does that automaticity play a role in giving a framework to understand new experiences? Um, so I think humans in general uh, shy away from new experiences and putting themselves in unfamiliar territory. Um, the the mental framework that one has to put themselves in to experience something new is typically an uncomfortable thing uh, for a human being because uh, go going down to our core psychology, we create, uh, we crave homeostasis. We crave, we crave repetition. We crave things that are repeatable because that is essentially what offsets chaos and our psychology is tempered towards that. Um, However, there is something to be said about how our psychology also likes novelty. Um, and so there has to be a balance um, between, obviously, the automaticity and that habitual, repetitious, that very predictable environment and the new experiences. So I think uh, and another way to interpret that, too, is understanding that when you have automatic behaviors, you have a very predisposed way of, of behaving and, and viewing the world when you are placed in a new environment as anthony mentions here that might give you a framework almost like a box that you're kind of stuck inside and it makes you hard to think outside of the box figuratively speaking because you're so stuck in these automatic behaviors this automatic way of processing this new experience that you're in you don't even realize that you're seeing it with some blinders on so being able to recognize the automaticity that you might not be able to help, you know, doing initially, you might, you know, it's automatic. You can't help looking at it like that the first time, but it would be a good exercise when you are experiencing something new to throughout that experience, try your best to change your own perspective on it a few times, being open to funny. seeing it from new ways. I think that ties nicely into what Danny said here. Um, I think automaticity mm. plays a huge role in how we understand experiences. Unfortunately, we are very judgmental beings. So that's kind of what you were just saying there, like try and change your perspective towards that new experience um, kind of as you're approaching it. Um, it's, it's definitely when we see new things and let's say we've created a very predictable, a very predictable reality around us. I think our first reaction to new stimulus is like a knee-jerk reaction like what the hell is that like it's not uh, it depends on the person um and that's that's one of those psychological uh personality things where openness is is a uh, one of those it's the ocean model that talks about the big five personality traits and openness to experience is one of those ones that's pretty easily uh, measurable not everybody um scores high on that so depending on um, how you are as an individual um kind of varies how you respond to that uh, new experience. Yeah, I can definitely see it being uh, something that needs to be practiced. It's not something that I would expect even people that are open to new perspectives to be able to recognize in their day to day uh, every time. I know for certain when I'm placed outside of my comfort zone or if I'm placed in a new experience, 
it takes me personally about five minutes to realize that the emotions I'm feeling are based on my automatic predisposition to that stimuli. And then after about five minutes, within that five minutes, I can process why I'm feeling this certain way. And then I can change my perspective to better fit the situation, you know? And sometimes this stuff is, there's, you know, place in stressful environments, you know? There's stressful situations that you, you might be placed in, whether it's uh, inside or outside of your locus of control. I think it's important to recognize how you're responding to it. it may many times be automatic, but you do have the choice to recognize when you're behaving in, autom in an automatic manner and change it consciously to better fit your mental health, you know, better suit your mental health and, and better be able to handle the situation that you're in. All right. Um, so let's talk about that next category here. Uh, so hit me with that multi-step hedonic behavior. So we just finished talking about the one-step hedonic behaviors being very um, almost like impulsive behaviors, um, like swiping on your phone or eating junk food. So what, what exactly is entailed in a multi-step hedonic behavior? Instant regarding the instant pleasure being hedonic and multi step, one of the ones I think about personally is uh, something I do every day in the morning is I, I make some coffee and I get the instant pleasure of getting the biochemical blocking of the sleepy feeling thanks to the caffeine in that coffee. But me personally, I either make drip or espresso coffee. And that takes some steps. I'm not grinding my own beans, but there's still some steps that I have to go through in order to get that coffee into a cup and, uh, you know, ingested before I go off to work or packed and brought to work, whether either one. But in the sense where I'm drinking the coffee right there, would you agree? That's a multi-step hedonic. I think, I think like setting up the coffee machine, getting your mug out, putting the like grinded up beans into the actual, yeah, that's, that's multiple steps um, on top of you having to be consciously or is it unconscious? I guess that's where this comes to. to so all, all these behaviors, none of them necessarily have to be conscious because we're assuming that based on the statistics we've, we've gone over before, about 40 percent of our day is, um, automatic. is automatic. Right. You know, it's a behavior. So, yes, I might have decided I'm tired. I want to drink coffee. But I've been deciding that for like six, seven, eight, nine billion years. No, <laughs> yeah. and that's that's the that's the contextual. Yeah. That's that's such a great um, that's such a great like thing to talk about right here. That's the contextual element of habits. Like you waking up in the morning, and your habit being to essentially go and make a cup of coffee. I think this is a great point to talk about how habits are very contextual. And how time of day is often one of those things that leads mm -hmm. to the execution of certain habits and it kind of has this whole um one after the other like step by step like once you've essentially reached the threshold that's caused you to begin this habit because you've been put in the context of oh it's morning and it just so happens that i'm tired like you're in that biochemical state boom habit begins automatically you're gonna go from point A to point B, you're going to execute algorithm function. No, I agree. There's many times where I've gotten my eight hours. I'm not necessarily sleep deprived, but it's morning. I got to go to work. Coffee is just part of the equation. <laughs> you know, right. it doesn't have to be too much intention there. It's just what I do. You know, it's what I do. So, yeah, it's what I do. And I wanted to say gym is another multi-step hedonic, but I, I, I think I should put that in the, multi-step distal honestly because there are instant pleasures you get from gym but i think the ones worth fighting for are the long-term pleasures of consistency in the gym so i'm going to go ahead and take that away from uh the instant pleasure and drop it into multi-step distal yeah and just to define multi-step distal when we say the word distal it, like in anatomy terms it means away from something else um, like every time, every time I hear the word distal, it's so funny that all these words in psychology also are used in a lot of anatomy and physiology, but distal basically means 
further away from one given point. So uh, sure. when we refer to habits being multi-step distal, that means that this habit is, it's going to take longer for you to see the effects of that habit. Um, Correct. So that's why Renee is saying, I'm going to categorize my, my desire to go into the gym and participate in this habit as a multi-step distal because why? Well, you got to take the time to get in your car. You got to take the time to put on your gym clothes. You got to take the time to get your gym bag ready. You got to get up in there. You got to get yourself amped up. You got to get yourself out of the mentality of, oh, I'm tired. I won't do it. Like you got to do all these different steps. So I definitely, um, I would say it is a multi-step distal. But what's interesting about the gym thing, at least in my case, the pre-workout portion is probably uh i would say more on the mm -hmm. hedonic side because i get that instant gratification when i take pre-workout um burst the caffeine hitting my um adenosine system making me not feel tired uh, which is amazing um and then that's that's kind of my cue uh that's the context that tells me uh essentially okay this is the context i take a swig of this drink and so i get i get a little hedonic right there but it gives rise to a more distal uh, benefit, which we know all the distal benefits of going to the gym, um, cardiovascular benefits, musculoskeletal benefits. You're essentially you're maintaining your longevity in life and you're going to have overall improved quality of life. Um, how does OK, so we got a question. here. How does a multi step distal hedonic act that is lifelong different from asceticism? OK. So when we say hedonic, we're talking about instant pleasure. And then in this case, he's saying multi-step distal, which is delayed, like the achieving of that goal is delayed. Then he said hedonic act. So if I were to translate this with that calculated form of, of phrasing, multi-step, long-term, but you get some instant pleasure from it. Is that is that kind of like the gym like we we're talking about? It could be both. You can get the endorphins from going to the gym instantly but the outcome of the going to the gym consistency is a distal goal is that and then you yeah. you probably could speak better about asceticism than i can so i think that's i think that's a fair assessment on what you just said um let's see let me see if i understand this question how does a multi-step distal hedonic act that is lifelong different from asceticism that's a deep question man um that's a good question i like it um so hedonism is still like at its core the accomplishment of short-term pleasure even if it takes multiple steps so a multi-step hedonic essentially just requires more steps to get to the instantaneous gratification. So binge drinking is the, the like primary example that's given in the book. Binge drinking essentially like it's the pursuit of instant pleasure, but you have to figure out like what pub you're going to go to, what drinks you're going to have and who you're going to socialize with if you're going to socialize with anybody. But it takes multiple steps to reach a more instantaneous pleasure because we know short term speaking, like drinking doesn't have long term benefits for you in this like present moment. If I was to do binge drinking, there's no there's no long term benefits um, versus if we were to compare that to asceticism, I would say asceticism is more like our multi step. Um, more like our multi step uh, distal behaviors where. You gain something that is off in the distance by saying no to a short-term pleasure like there is no there is no immediate positive outcome to this thing and in some cases you'll even get pain like the gym for example like you're working out and you're exercising it's it's multiple steps you have to go to the gym you have to do all these different things to get to the gym and it even involves a little bit of pain because when you're in the gym it kind of hurts if you're actually pushing yourself and you're challenging um so I would liken the philosophy of asceticism to um, our multi-step distal. Uh, so Agreed. multi, so multi-step hedonic is one category, and then multi-step distal is another category. 
So you have single step and you have multi-step and then you have distal and you have hedonic. Then you can combine those two. So you, it's, there's a, is a quadrant. It's kind of like, you can do like a Punnett square with it essentially. And you can make, make a combination of those things. Uh, so hedonic cannot be distal. That is correct. Hedonic cannot be distal at least. Yeah, exactly. So this, exactly. this is the chart he's talking about. We have the one step hedonic and then we have one step distal. Then you have multi-step hedonic and multi-step distal. As you see, there's two categories for hedonic and two categories for distal, and they're shared by the one step and multi-step. Right. So per the definition of the current psychological literature, um, hedonic cannot be distal because hedonic by its very nature is for the short term. It is for the instant pleasure, not for the distal or often the future pleasure. So I, I'm i not going to say that those two are the same. Distal is not necessarily asceticism, but I am, when I discuss it, um, I'm trying to make like a, like a philosophical point and tie in some philosophies right. to this. Um, basically, I'm saying that distal multi-step is a lot like the philosophy of asceticism which is denying oneself for essentially spiritual or some greater sense of attainment that is not to be experienced in the current uh, moment right and also i want to clarify that this form of categorizing that we're using now which takes one step multi-step distal, hedonic, takes all those four categories and combines them. It's one of the many ways of categorizing habits that exist, one of the many ways that has been published on. This is simply the way that the reading that we're discussing today has chosen to categorize habits because it's one of the, in their, in their view, one of the better ways to actually measure habit, to be aware of it. It's using this form of categorization. Right. Which there's, there's a lot of different forms. This just happens to be one of them. And I think it's pretty good too, because it, it gave me personally a lot of self-awareness on what behaviors, what habitual behaviors were being instantly gratified and which of those instant gratifying behaviors I could do in one step and which of them took me, you know, a few steps to actually accomplish. And it also gave me and the harder ones to think. Those are the ones I've recognized now, I want to say. The ones that have been harder for me to recognize are which behaviors are one step distal and which behaviors are one step or multi-step distal, rather. Which recognizing is a whole intervention in itself that we'll actually get into in a little bit. Right, um, right. But I like, I like that you talked about, like, this is just one view. This is just one way of understanding habits. And I think that that's like a that's a meta discussion that we can have, which is like, that's, that's what empiricism is. The scientific method is just you taking one lens to one concept and then trying to demonstrate that it's repeatable. And so that's kind of what we're doing. And we're only defining this one specific narrow concept using like using this, this form of uh, words to essentially define these characteristics that, that we've noticed that are repeatable. So, um, that the scientific method is, is a, it's like, it's a lens, but there are so many lenses that you can take on throughout life. And there are so many different ways to look at the world around you. Um, that like to define it purely with just this is never great. And that's why I think, um, the scientific method isn't, it's not meant to be like, uh, what's the word? You're not supposed to be dogmatic with it. Like the second that you find yourself, adhering very strictly to one law like before um what was his name Ugh, crazy i just forgot his name before albert einstein discussed uh, the theory of relativity everything was newtonian physics and then this guy comes along and just totally takes a poopy on newtonian physics hmm. and like like it's like so the second you hang on to something and this is true in psychology too like don't hang on to your beliefs too tightly because likely 
likely empiricism, while it's useful to look at the world in a certain lens, it may be disproven. And so sure. any any psychological concepts that we're talking about here, like, yes, it can be disproven. It can be there can be other words that you can use to describe these psychological phenomena. But like for now, this is the terminology and the psychological research that we're using to define these concepts. And we definitely encourage you to, to challenge it, whether it be through your own experiences or in the, in the comment section. Uh, it's definitely something that is part of this exercise that we're sharing this knowledge with you all. It's, mo it's supposed to make you think and, and actually look at these things uh, in a way that questions, makes you question your own form of, of how you're processing it and also questions how other people are processing what they deem to be habits and behaviors, etc. But if we do continue with the form that we're using today, we said a one-step hedonic being a social media and we said a multi-step hedonic was like making coffee. If you go to one-step distal, I just want to point out something. It's it's almost counterintuitive in this now that we're breaking down the definitions of these things. It's one step. You do that step right now, but the reward for that step, you don't see it for I mean it could be years, it could be a lifetime, you know. It's very interesting that there's so many steps in between these habitual behaviors before you actually reap the benefits of it. And uh, I notice that sometimes those one step distal, uh, they're actually many times the benefits from those come from good habits. And um, there's many one step distal that are actually the consequences of one step hedonic habits. So let's talk about like smoking, right? Smoking a cigarette is a one step hedonic instant pleasure habit. But technically, if you look at it, it could also be a one step distal habit in the sense, but in the sense that distal being the consequence <laughs> of that habit. The consequence of lung failure. You know what I mean? Like I was like, wait, what is it? because like for good habits, where if you're looking at the instant pleasure, if you're looking at the goal of these habits as the positive, the pleasurable part of it, then you can keep going the way we're looking at it. But if you look at the, rather than thinking of it as the consequence being a pleasure, what if the unintended goal is actually just a negative outcome? Would that make these things, would that make something like cigarettes a one-step hedonic uh, behavior? Would that also make it a one-step distal behavior with the outcome actually being, yeah, you know, detrimental health consequences? Would that be an appropriate way of challenging this this view? Yeah, I think you you could absolutely um, kind of like what Danny's saying here. I mean, Newtonian physics still stands despite Einstein making his discoveries, but it's one frame of reference to understand the world around you. So what you just said doesn't invalidate necessarily um, what what uh, Bas Verplanck is trying to like the points he's trying to make with this book, but like it still, it's just another frame of reference. Correct. So, so yeah, like, and much like, as I was saying there, um, the book talks about these, the outcomes of these habits being the positive. But I think if you challenge yourself to look at the outcomes of your bad habits, the consequences that they bring, you can actually find multiple layers of the same four behaviors that we have here, the same four forms of categorizing it. Um, but I actually want to go back to one of the things we were talking about before regarding intention and habit strength. How long does it take before these one-step hedonic behaviors or these multi-step behaviors, how long do you, do you have to have intention in each of those steps? Or can you have a one-step hedonic pleasure? And then as you layer, because we know, as we talked about before, there's like preparation habits. There's also reward behaviors that could do after you've done something good and you can make each of those steps uh, part of the habitual behavior framework. Do you think that layering some distal and hedonic behaviors together can actually give you the most bang for your buck? As we joked about before, talking about the chocolate bar, not a literal chocolate bar, but some form of uh, Snickers, right? Some form of reward that you can give yourself after doing some kind of distal behavior such as if I'm studying, that's a multi-step distal behavior because I don't see the benefits from that studying instantly. 
at least I'm not rewarded for that studying instantly. But if I mix in some one-step hedonic pleasures as study breaks, do you think that's a good way to kind of hack your brain into thinking that the multi-step distal is actually giving you instant pleasure? I think it's it's a valid way to keep yourself going and to prevent um, what I termed in one of our YouTube videos as ego depletion. Um, that's the whole willpower drainage concept. Um, so having short-term hedonic um, habits or pleasures built into longer-term distal benefits um, or benefit uh, long-term distal habits, um, I think is a really good way to prevent like that psychological burnout. Um, because yeah, you can you can exercise your willpower, um, but the fact that willpower is something that is limited um, is something that that has to be kind of taken into account as you try and pursue multi-step distal uh, types of habits. Um, you have to you have to have something to balance uh, the tax that 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 takes on your willpower. It's very taxing, um, and so I, to your question, I think yeah, having having one step hedonic built into your multi-step distal habits is very a very useful way um, to keep yourself going, and um, I think it makes life a little bit more enjoyable overall. You know, um, it. And especially kind of like what we talked about in that other episode, if we're mindful about those moments where we do reward ourselves with some shorter term pleasures, not like not like garbage short term pleasures, but like you can reward yourself if you're really grinding and you're really sitting there studying a very difficult concept um, or uh, you're working really hard at work and you take like a little five minute break. Being very present for that five minute break can be just as rewarding as like scrolling on your phone. It's just a matter of like, are you present for it? And are you really in the moment telling yourself, man, this is this is a great moment right here. I just got done working hard and I'm sitting here enjoying like enjoying this present moment. And, you know, have have like a little little juice with you or a little something that you can sip on. Like, a, you know, coffee is a great one um, to make that moment like just a little bit more like you can savor that that little break that you're having, that little hedonic kick. Um so I definitely, um, with regards to what you're saying, I think that it kind of ties into the whole, like, achieving your overall um, life's goals. Yeah, I think it's a great thing to implement when you're trying to build new habits. And um, I, I've even seen it. And I know we're going to go into interventions in a bit and talking about ways to disrupt um, habits but speaking of when you're making new ones, I think it's very interesting how you can almost trick yourself into getting that instant pleasure, like you said, from the short term, when you're really trying to train a long term behavior. And it's important, like you said, regarding the willpower too, because based on the literature we've read, it's much, much harder to form a multi-step distal behaviors arguably one of the harder habits to form because it takes so many steps to actually complete it. So many behavioral steps that have to become automatic and then the reward from doing so is not seen. So it's almost like you're training your brain to do this repetitive behavior and it's not getting the gratification for doing so. It's just going solely off of willpower. That is until you finally reach that distal end and you get the goal achieving satisfaction, then that can go ahead and in turn fuel this behavior more and more until eventually you need less intention because it has enough habitual strength to propagate the multi-step behaviors that you're trying to achieve. That's, that's huge that you just said that because literally <laughs> like multi-step distal behaviors, like the, thing that makes you more likely and the book literally it's almost like word for word like you read the book or something um, i was kidding but it literally says like individuals with higher levels of habit were likely to carry out their their behaviors despite their intentions so so the habitual development is a keystone element in you being able to maintain your behaviors 
despite like what your will, what your mind, what your rationale wants, like so that like those with lower habit strength are less likely to perform that behavior that they desire. And um, that was a study done by Alam, Molin, and Sebastian in a 2013 study uh, that looked into like sun protection behaviors. Um, a study basically, it was trying to see if... Over oh, sunscreen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was, but it's like a multi-step thing because they have to like put on this like sun resistant shirt and they have to put on sunscreen, sunglasses. And it was trying to determine like, what, what is the element that makes these individuals more likely to participate in the habit of, you know, sun protection. And so the, the keystone element there was that they had already developed this, this habit, this habit of putting on sun protection before they got out into the sun. And so when you're looking to develop healthier habits, overall better habits for your life, well, understand that habits are the biggest determinant of you being able to reach your life's overall goals uh, because they operate in the background. It's almost like it's like an investment, man. Once you make that initial willpower investment, it keeps giving back to you, which is why in your younger years of life, it's so important that you establish good habits. So later in life, you can have those habits give back to you because you've made the investment in your younger years. You've set your mind up to participate in healthy habits because habits are automatic, because habits are very predictive of your future behaviors. If you successfully implement these things into your life, you don't have to, I mean, mind you, if you want to change your behaviors, go for it in the future, but you can run on autopilot in a healthy fashion if you've established good habits. And that means you have to use less of your cognitive willpower and you, the things that you do automatically, you wake up in the morning, you're driven, you study, you you learn new things, you go for a run, like you accomplish everything that you need to in the day because your habits are so healthy. And later in life, that's one of those things that'll just give you so much back and it'll return in dividends. It's it's amazing. Yeah, speaking of um, when you incorporate these habits and the actual distal benefits you can gain from it, Another example mentioned in the literature was eating vegetables. And I think this uh, uh, relates to me a lot in the sense that when I was young, I did not like eating vegetables. And I certainly wasn't going to the effort, the multiple steps to prepare it. I was simply pushing them away from whatever I wanted to eat on my feet. Feed him to the dog. <laughs> exactly. It's good. I don't yeah. think so. I'm not eating that broccoli. You know? And then uh, as I started learning how to uh, to spice up my, my food, uh, I think, you know, oh, what if I put some like some cheese on this vegetable? I'm gonna put a little bit of butter on this. Oh, but instant gratification from those those little seasoned additions to it got me actually, you know, to start eating the vegetable. Then actually learning how to to cook and make more complex meals, another multi-step distal behavior. I mean, I don't even think about it when I'm going grocery shopping. I'm not going out and just buying, you know, the protein source. I have to make a stop at the produce section and I'm getting all my little veggies and fruits, you know, that I need there because it's a part of the recipe. Right. And now I don't I don't really consciously think oh, I'm eating these because my mama told me to eat my vegetables and it's good for you. That one, you know, in Spider-Man 3, he says, eat your vegetables. Like, That's why I do it. No, it's like, <laughs> you know, you do it because it's, it's been incorporated. It's automatic now. And, um, and if there's anyone out there that likes to cook, you know, like it's just... There's things that complement the meal, so you can get kind of creative with it. And uh, I've, I've had a lot of fun eating vegetables now. And I hope that's a behavior that I can continue to do. And I, I'm sure I will. Uh, <laughs> to Daniel's comment, to have better habits, you just got to already have better habits. Um, that, that's actually, I mean, it kind of sucks to say, but that's, that's, that's kind of the point I was making. It sucks. But what I like to further clarify that what I'm saying there is you got to make the initial investment like before habits are formed. You have to go through the period of discomfort. You have to go through all the hard work, the mental, rational, the willpower draining period to establish the habit. It's 90, 90 days essentially is what the literature suggests for you to make a lifestyle change. And it's 21 days to start the formation of a habit. So 
If that's the case, you have to go through the 21 to 90 day period of discomfort. And then once you've done that, to have better habits, guess what? You've started having good habits by going right. through that period of discomfort. Now it snowballs into better habits. Right, right. Yeah, I definitely want to I disagree from the term that you have to have good habits in order to make ha good habits. It's like, no, you have to have good intentions. And then those good intentions will eventually commit repeated behaviors, which lead to that first habit. And like Daniel just said, once you've done that, you've you've given some momentum to that little snowball. Yeah, you got to embrace that sucky start. That's for sure. Right. Absolutely. Yes, precisely. Um, let's see. You want to hit those interventions, my guy? Yeah, definitely. All right. All right, so let's talk about that a little bit. Um, so I think one of the primary things the book kind of emphasizes in the very beginning when it talks about what interventions we have for changing your behavior and changing your habits Behavior change and habit change has to be tapered to the specific kind of behavior. So you have to determine first, is it a one-step hedonic behavior? Is it a multi-step hedonic? Is it a multi-step distal or one-step distal? Once you've made that determination, um, then we can go ahead and determine, okay, what is the most appropriate intervention? Um, so when we talk about interventions, the primary one that seems to be uh, very beneficial for intervening into our hedonic behaviors uh, that is called mental contrasting and mental contrasting is interesting it's it basically forces you to take a look at where you are and where do you want to be and it involves visualizing like your ideal future and like asking yourself is is where i am right now like is this is this it for me and if so like these habits that i'm participating in like like is this ultimately what i want so it's it's a it essentially encourages you to compare now versus then like your ideal future and that forces you into a state of action and that's why this intervention is so powerful um mental contrasting uh, at least in the literature, was one of the more successful interventions that help people essentially change out of their one-step hedonic behaviors. Um, the other one was implementation intentions. That's the other um, type of intervention that we have to change uh, one-step hedonic behaviors. And That's that also is, for uh, one-step distal as well. Right, right. And basically, the way that that operates you write down a goal and then you write out specific details about accomplishing that behavior change. So like, yeah, you have some kind of outcome that you want, but unless you write out the specific steps, like when do I have time to accomplish this habit or like what different tools do I need to make this thing happen? Like, unless you write out these specifics about accomplishing the behavior change and about making that habit, normal in your life it, it's essentially it it is less likely to happen so that was another form of intervention that yes that was not only beneficial for multi or, um one step hedonic uh but it's also for the um multi-step distal so let's see and then I think the book also noted something interesting here too, which is one step behaviors appear to take a shorter period of time to become habitual. Whereas multi-step behaviors are likely to take longer to become habitual. And I guess maybe yeah. that's just one of those things. Like maybe I could have come to that with my own intuition. Um, but now we have some kind of like empirical evidence to support that multi-step um multi-step behaviors are likely to take longer to become habitual than the short term yeah i also think it's interesting how like you mentioned the uh intention implementation and the uh the actual 
not just awareness to a behavior that you want to start or stop, but the intention that you have to have to the repetition of it in order to overcome a behavior, in order to overcome the desire to not want to do that behavior, you know, whatever it is that you're trying to to fight right now using your willpower, it takes um, that intentionality to truly actually create this strong behavior that happens automatically. And when we keep talking about how willpower, based on all the literature that we read, is very limited, it makes sense why high successful people how you want to define success might vary, but you know, people that are able to put out a, a substantial workload, I think the reason why they're doing so is that all the critical thinking they have to do throughout the day, it's all happening. It, it, it's, it's all happening in a way that needs a lot of mental energy, as we know. But they're able to perform that task and they have that mental energy available to them because all the other behaviors that they do and they have done in order to put out a high workload and make them successful, those are all automatic at this point, you know? And so it's overwhelming to think that you have to incorporate all these habits all at once. Like if you've seen those YouTube videos where it's like, this is my morning routine. And it's like Jeff Bezos, like, first I inject myself with with some future <laughs> yeah future <laughs> you know, it's just it's interesting that people <laughs> watch that stuff though it, it tells you that i think like deep down at like like on a human level we we want to know like what does it take to be successful and like what are these people doing in their morning routine but there's no shortcut even if even if you did all those morning routines that's that's not gonna be what makes you successful it's a matter of having the intention to target a behavior that you want to do is to target something and then have the willpower to sustain that behavior repetitively until eventually it switches and becomes an automatic habitual behavior. Then boom, that's automatic now. I'm going to keep doing that behavior, but now it takes less mental energy. So now I can take the mental energy, the willpower that I have today, and I'm going to put it for the next behavior that I want to make automatic. And you just keep going. And you have to just keep stacking them up. You know, that's why... Living a very complacent lifestyle is, is dangerous because you're not exercising that willpower. You're essentially just complacent and being on autopilot and doing your automatic behaviors all day, you know? And I think I think a huge element to sort of there's there was another intervention that I read up on that kind of gets you through that sucky period of like those first 90 days when you're trying to use your willpower to get to a new habit. Um, and that, that was called, uh, let me see here. Self monitoring. Okay. And so the self monitoring intervention, uh, basically it's like journaling and it's nice when you have like a psychologist that you can talk to this stuff about, cause they can actually like, successfully intervene without you having to like go and find self-help resources but basically self-monitoring is like having something that holds you accountable and you journal about it and you ask yourself how did i do today with that new habit that i'm trying to establish and you have like a checklist and that's actually something that i have implemented in my life for the habits that i'm trying to establish it's like how many days out of the week did i hit this habit successfully and what can i do to more successfully on a day-to-day -day basis accomplish that habit um and i have this like it's like a daily planner it's a, it's a really dude i love my planner so much but it, like it asks me questions at the end of every, every single day it's like what did you do today and how can you do it better and like what did you not do so great today and how can you fix that um so like that that's that self-monitoring it's an intervention um like i said it's nice to be able to talk about it but if you don't have anybody to talk to about like establishing your habit and going through the sucky period in the first 90 days, um, then that's a really nice tool to have to kind of keep you going. And so you can, you can push through that difficult period. Absolutely. And there's a lot of different um, groups that exist to help people where they're trying to 
start new habits and alcoholics some, anonymous well yeah that would be right that'd be stopping you know those are intervention groups um both the intervention groups and the the gurus out there that are trying to help you improve your life through their self-help book what they have in common is they give both of these parties the ability to have the awareness of their habits by monitoring them and then giving themselves feedback and then also they provide a social experience where they could have feedback shared amongst themselves amongst others which could be especially powerful because then it helps them have perspective to the habits that they're doing as well as seeing other people that have a more advanced self sense of self-awareness and recognizing that oh i can i can i never thought about looking at that behavior that i was doing you know so it, it gives others the ability to uh increase their capacity and their self-awareness when they are monitoring via the the feedback that they're able to share with one another and then that just helps shape their their knowledge of what they're facing you know in, in general because without being able to categorize the behavior you're doing whether it be like we talked about today the one step hedonic multi-step hedonic one step distal multi-step distal right like if that's how you want to categorize it great if there's other ways to categorize it by all means do so whatever works for you it's just a matter of being able to have the awareness of what you're doing and then shaping those goals that you're currently reaching for and comparing it to what you actually want to attain and be patient with yourself because all these things where you're trying to start a habit or break bad ones it takes so much time it takes so much we're, we're we're essentially the reason why these things reach these levels of automaticity is because the wiring to do that behavior is as instant as the light turning on when you flip a switch in your room and but that wiring took a long long time a lot of repetition for that to eventually reach that level of automaticity that instantaneous behavior once you see the cue it's on you know you've done it before you even know you've done it so if you're trying to break a habit just ha having the awareness of all that is going to help you stop yourself from executing the behavior or maybe stop yourself before you've gone too far into the behavior because you're starting to recognize why it's automatic and when you're starting one you gotta be patient because it doesn't you can't just make that connection you know unless you're an electrician i guess you could make that connection pretty quickly but if you're not an electrician and the behavior you're making has nothing to do with electricity <laughs> it's gonna take a while as you said right. like 90 days um and from like a neurological standpoint uh to kind of further edify what you're saying um we know that the brain forms different pathways based off of the activities that we do every single day. We are neuroplastic creatures. So yes, it is possible that we change our behaviors. We have something called a BDNF brain derived neurotrophic factor. That's something that allows our brains to be more neuroplastic. And the more that we participate in different behaviors, the more we strengthen different pathways and the more other pathways slowly begin to die. And that's why that 90 day period um, not only holds true, in psychological literature, but it holds true in some of the more biochemical, more like objective literature, which is really neat because I love it when, when neuro, like biology hooks up with psychology, like those two together is such a powerful combination. So when we recognize that it takes a while for certain pathways to weaken and for those neurons to lose their strength of connection and then for us to form new neuronal pathways takes a lot of effort. And it's very interesting, like with any, like if we talked about like playing an instrument, for example, like you become more efficient, your neuronal pathways fire more efficiently when you've reached that 90 day period of playing guitar every single day or whatever habit, going to the gym every single day, running like the neuronal pathways leading to that point in time, all of that fires more efficiently. And so, I think that's one of those keystone elements to understand when you're trying to form habits is that neurologically speaking, every single thing that we do, uh, it can become more efficient over time, not only from like a automaticity standpoint, but also from a neurological standpoint. 
And I also love the neurological reasoning uh, and the science out there on, on neuroplasticity and your ability to rewire yourself. It's, it's your brain is capable of plenty, whether it's attaining these habits and these automatic behaviors or it's completely rewiring itself. I would like to go more into uh, a neurological perspective of the philosophy that we've discussed thus far uh, in later podcasts, because I think we that deserves a very in-depth uh, description, uh, discussion rather. Yeah, that's a huge topic. Um, we got we got a lot of things on our on our chopping block. We want to hit supplements like nootropics um, for optimizing brain function. Um, and we got a lot of other things for you, ladies and gentlemen, in future episodes. You know, uh, one of the things I want to mention, too, for one step distal is that supplement that you were talking about. Would you consider taking supplements a one step hedonic because you just take it and you're there? Or is that a one step distal because you're talking about like vitamins, you're talking about, you know, a creatine, protein, I'd be distal, right? It depends on the supplement. Sure. Uh, so. I would put caffeine in the more like one step, like very uh, one step distal or potentially even actually, I don't know, man. I might put caffeine in one step uh, hedonic. I put caffeine multi-step hedonic because you're making the coffee. I got but you. yes, just I drinking the coffee. Yes. If you've already got it pre-made. Yeah. Pre-made like or like <laughs> in a can or something. I'm going to put that in like one step um, right. hedonic. Right. However, other supplements, you don't see the effects until weeks and weeks out, like paracetam, which increases BDNF and uh, brain neuroplasticity and your ability to form memories, that sort of thing. Uh, paracetam would be more distal or like things like fish oil. You're not going to see the benefits of mm -hmm. omega, like triglyceride regulation immediately. That's one of those things that you're, you're going to be thankful for your, for your younger self when you get older for the supplementation of, of something that regulates your triglycerides. That's what omega-3 um, fatty acids do, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. Um, other things like your vitamin C supplementation, um, you're going to take, I mean, maybe you take like a maintenance dose every single day. That's that's one of those things that you're not going to see the benefit right now. Um, but, you know, as weeks go by and you notice yourself not getting sick, you can thank yourself and that's more distal. Um, yeah, I could go into... One, once again, we, we need to dedicate an episode to supplements because I've, I've spent way too much time uh, not only working in the supplement industry, but um, in my own time, just researching uh, different yeah. ways to optimize brain function. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, I think that, that both of the topics that we just hit on at the end there need their own episode. Yeah. Um, would you be open to doing that next time? Oh, we Choose could. one of those two. Yeah. We take a little break from um, maybe, maybe not on Monday, but I would say the not the next episode, but the next after next. That way we have a good week, you know, yeah, to really dive into these topics. Uh, they're they're a bit different though, so I think each of them deserves their own. No, I agree. Um, we can hit neural would be more relevant to what we're doing here. Uh, Today. Yeah, I, what, what we could do, we could hit neuro and then tie neuro into habit psychology. Um, and then just like make it a nice package. Um, nice package. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Um, I think that would be useful. Uh, really? Do you have any more you want to say on the interventions to help our viewers break their habit? Let's see. So far, um, based I, on the, I, the book itself. Yeah, I, I guess I've hit all the primary interventions that have been noted to be successful with habit change. But I guess there's one more point that I'd like to make, which is know that under cognitive load, under periods of stress, under like difficult points in your life, individuals tend to fall back onto their habits. And this should be considered when you're aiming to change your habits. And if you're trying to have one of those interventions that we discussed earlier implemented successfully, like know that when you hit a, like when the rubber hits the road and life gets difficult, um, maybe, and I guess a way to think about this would be like for those 90 days, 
if you can really set the tone and make your environment predictable, and if you can do everything in your power to make it so that your life is easy for those 90 days, if there's a habit you are trying to break or implement into your life, if there's something you can do for 90 days to make your life a little bit easier, um, to make your life a little bit more predictable, put yourself in an environment where you think like you'll be in more control of your life because you've willingly taken on this chaotic bit, which is changing mm -hmm. your habit. Mm -hmm. If you can, if you can somehow like reduce the other elements that might add difficulty to your life, that'll make you more likely to be successful with your habit implementation. Because for the book, as what I, what I just said, when difficulty hits and when you are under more cognitive load, cognitive stressors, you are more likely to succumb to different habits that you've already established. Absolutely. I think absolutely. Especially for people that are trying to break bad habits. I think it's really important to take as much into consideration uh, to do so. Uh, and and um, it's unfortunate, you know, when, when things get tough, like you said, you want to fall on those habits. And if you're trying to break a bad habit and then life isn't going as planned elsewhere, it can be really, really, really hard to maintain yourself uh, in that, you know, positive state of avoiding the bad habit, but just recognize that you got to be patient with yourself and um, you got to take it as it is some days. Some days you just got dealt a bad hand, but as long as you're consistent and you get back to it and you repeat, that's the other important part, if you, as long as you repeat the good behaviors, the ones that are replacing the bad habit and make sure that you make that the status quo in your life, eventually when things get bad, you're going to do that good behavior that you've been repeating that you've turned into a good habit versus falling back onto the bad behavior that you've hopefully rewired by that time, you know, because you can't always avoid the cues, right? And even though that, that's the ideal way of, of intervening into a habit is just avoiding the cues. You can't always do that. Right. But if you can, like Daniel said, try to control the atmosphere. It's going to help you in the long run. That was dope. Dopamine. That was <laughs> dopamine versus serotonin. That's another thing that we, we could have gotten oh, yeah. into here. Yeah, these last 20 minutes, I'm going to have to go back and rewatch this so I can figure out where we want to go for our next few episodes. But I, th I think generally speaking, that that neuro idea is a really good, like, yeah. we'll come back and hit this book again. Um, but yeah, um, I think there's other stuff that we should hit. I, I've been craving a, a more biological approach okay because we've been doing a lot of philosophy and, and uh, behavior and psychology yeah but i really want to get into those those chemicals you know let's do it man i, I love this tick i love all the above <laughs> well thank you well, Daniel. and also and in, the, in the future too. in the future yes. we will hit a heavy heavy philosophy episode I'm um, ready. But I'll, I'll prepare you for it because we've done We've done like mild to moderate philosophy, but we'll do like a very uh, philosophy dominant episode. Um, and I'll, um, I'll uh, obviously give you the, the topics. The heads I, ups. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. I'm either going to sound really smart or I'm going to sound like uh, some, some kid with a guitar in the back of a party. Like, whoa, dude, like what if you took like, the what? science and then you made it into like, Aliens. What? <laughs> Aliens. <laughs> yeah, that's what it's going to be. Aliens. It's going to get hella casual um, because I think with a lot of philosophy, there's plenty written works from great minds in the world, but whatever's coming from this mind is going to be uh, limited to my, my youthful perspective. And let me throw this out there. Why, why do I even think philosophy is valid in this day and age of science and empiricism? Because I think this day and age has become over reliant on the empirical method to give ourselves value in the modern world. I don't like, don't get me wrong. I will never poopy on science because science is going to give me a living and it's going to give you a living. Thank you, science, for all that you've done for us. Shout However, out shout out to science. But, but what I'm going to say is that science is not the only lens through which we can look at the world. Like philosophy and different spiritual traditions also have they have a way to give our life some kind of meaning because science does not successfully answer like why it is that we do what we do, why we as human beings like even exist. And, and the, the best part is science does not answer 
why science is valid. You cannot use the scientific method to validate science. Like, think about that for a second. I always think about that. I'm like, okay. So there, there's other things. Like, because you cannot separate you, you yourself, the viewer, from interpreting the scientific data. You can never do that. Like, you, the viewer, can, like, your limited perspective as a human being still has to interpret the data that science generates. So science is not impervious. It is not perfect in every way. And it does not give our life intrinsic value. So I always I always like to discuss that and to say like philosophy and different religious traditions are are something that I think is very needed right now, because a lot of people are struggling for meaning. A lot of people are looking for for a way to add something deeper to their lives to, to answer like what what me human being? What what do I do? Why here? Why me? I will say if, if anything, philosophy and, and the practice of studying past present and uh using your mind to think of your own philosophy in the very least it brings about a lot of questions and those questions may or may not be able to be answered through science some have been answered through science others might eventually be answered through science but there's plenty that it's still just up to our own imagination and interpretation so that's why i think it's important to incorporate that at some point as well but thank you for today's psychological analysis of habits, whether they be short-term, distal, whether they take one step or many steps. All of them, all of the above. It's been good. And I hope it, I hope it gives you, the viewer, as well, some uh, curiosity. Don't stay up at night thinking about this, but definitely try to, as you go about your day, categorize some of the things you do. You know, as someone in the comments mentioned earlier about the coffee example, they said if making coffee is a multi-step hedonic act, then is there anything that could really be one step? And that's great. It's something great to think about. You know, what do you think is just one step, but actually has involved multiple steps leading up to that step that are also behaviors and automatic habits? You know, the more you look at it, the more you realize that there's very few things that are simply just one step. It's oftentimes multiple pre-existing steps that lead up to that behavior. So, But being aware of it is the key. Being yeah. aware of where you are as you go to those lead-in steps, I think, is, I think that's what makes this whole discussion that we're having so powerful. Exactly. But with that, I think we're going to go ahead and sign off. This has been Nurturing our nature with daniel and renee discussing the fantastic book this time of uh, psychology of habits edited by vast for Plinken and published by springer if you'd like to access that book i encourage you to do so and read up on it and if you want to comment you can we'll have discussions here on youtube twitch etc but until then we'll see you monday Happy Friday, dude. Happy Ladies weekend. Ladies and gentlemen. Peace. Signing off. Signing off.